What's lurking in this fermented food will haunt you. Fermentation makes people barf. No. No. Fermented fruit and vegetables are safe to make and eat at home. And fermentation has been used since cavemen were riding on dinosaurs. Cheese, yogurt, beer, wine, mead, cider, whiskey, vinegar, chocolate, coffee, salami, pepperoni, koji, tempeh, miso, soy sauce, fish sauce, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, kvass, kombucha, kefir, sourdough, olives, relish, ketchup, mustard, hot sauce. <sighs> All of those foods are fermented foods. Hi, I'm Lanny and this is Preserving Today. Today I wanna to talk about why vegetable fermentation is inherently safe. Fermented fruit and vegetables are safe to make and eat at home. Yes, I would totally get more clicks if my video was playing up the fear and uncertainty. Fermented food's gonna make you sick. Here's why fermented food's gonna murder your family. Did you know this poisonous monster was lurking in your refrigerator? Don't let the homesteaders fool you fermentation makes people barf. But really, fermentation is safe, and to say anything else is just lying. One of the most common questions I get from people taking my fermentation workshops in person and online is, how do I know my ferment is safe to eat? Or maybe they'll ask it like, how do I know my ferment is safe to leave on the counter? because fermentation happens at room temperature. This question comes from a place of fear or worry based on what we think we know about food poisoning and foodborne illness. I get it, I was there too. That's exactly how I felt when I first started to ferment food. To understand why fermentation was safe for me, I really needed to understand two things, how we get sick from food and what fermentation actually is. So let's dive in. Fact, you can get sick from improperly handled food. If you've ever worked in a restaurant, you had to get a food handler's permit. And to earn that distinguished certification, you had to read a pamphlet and take a test. The information inside of that tiny book is usually the full extent of understanding of food poisoning and food safety that a regular person has. And if you have not worked in food, you might not even have that much of an understanding. Well, lots of people can worry about getting sick from food and getting foodborne illness, but they might not really know how it happens. And what they do know comes from what they hear on the news or from friends. Dozens sickened after E. coli outbreak stemming from bagged spinach. Or hundreds suffering after diarrhea mud flood ravages cruise liner thanks to norovirus. Or maybe it's listeria on cantaloupe, salmonella on chicken, botulism in home canned food. Most people have read the warning labels on the bottom of the menu at your favorite diner, saying consuming raw or undercooked meat, poultry, seafood, shellfish, or eggs may increase your risk of foodborne illness. But why is that? So if those bacteria, listeria, E. coli, streptococcus, staph, salmonella, and the rest, if those bacteria are present at all, does that mean we get sick? And those bacteria just magically show up if you leave your food at room temperature, right? Not exactly. There's more nuance, like with most things. Okay, let's talk about how we actually get sick from food. According to the USDA's Food and Safety Inspection Service, foodborne illness is an illness that comes from eating contaminated food. Anyone can get sick from foodborne illness. However, some people are at greater risk for experiencing a more serious illness or even death should they get a foodborne illness. This is one part of this that I want to emphasize. Some people become ill after ingesting only a few harmful bacteria. Others may remain symptom-free after ingesting thousands. Thousands of types of bacteria are naturally present in our environment. Microorganisms that can cause disease are called pathogens. When certain pathogens enter the food supply, they can cause foodborne illness. Are you bored yet? It's so boring when I'm reading stuff. Not all bacteria cause disease in humans. For example, some bacteria are used beneficially in making cheese and yogurt. And that's what fermentation is, guys. We're using beneficial bacteria to preserve the food when we're making fermented vegetables. Most cases of foodborne illness can be prevented with proper cooking or processing of food to destroy pathogens. Bacteria multiply rapidly between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. To keep food out of the danger zone, keep cold food cold and hot food hot. Now, we have a basic understanding of what the experts say how we get sick from foodborne illness. So why don't we look into how fermentation works? Here's what the official statement is of what fermentation means. Fermentation is a metabolic process where organisms like lactobacillus bacteria break down sugar and carbohydrate. The byproduct are acids, like lactic acid or acetic acid, and carbon dioxide, CO2, or 
bubbly carbonation. This process occurs without oxygen. Mold cannot grow without oxygen. So fermentation also prevents mold or other fungal growths that need oxygen to grow. Fermentation is the act of cultivating a natural environment and where beneficial bacteria can thrive and grow. In turn, it creates an environment where harmful bacteria cannot grow. Okay, here's my take on things. So bacteria are on everything. We are alive and then the food we eat in nature is alive. You can kill bacteria by heating things up to at least 165 degrees, but bacteria will return and start to grow when the food cools because bacteria is everywhere and we cannot escape it. Bacteria grows best between 40 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit, also known as the highway to the danger zone. And some people can eat buckets of harmful bacteria and be absolutely fine, while others can get a tiny speck in their mouth hole and be really, really sick. Wild, right? Are you more confused now? Here, this won't help either. Did you know E. coli bacteria is naturally found in the human intestinal tract? In normal, healthy humans, E. coli helps us digest food, produce vitamins, and protect us from harmful bacteria. Yes, it protects us from a harmful bacterial imbalance in our intestines, like C. diff, which you might've heard of as a side effect from overuse of antibiotics. A healthy GI system has E. coli in it. Even E. coli is healthy when it's in balance and in the right part of our body. Streptococcus or strep is also commonly found in the human microbiome, including the mouth, intestines, and reproductive tract. Same with staph, on the skin, and in the mucous membranes. These bad bacteria actually have a purpose, and it is only when they're out of balance that it becomes a problem. When we sanitize or use antibiotic, it does not discriminate. It kills any type of bacteria, not just the bad. Over sanitizing things, the overuse of antibiotics and poor living conditions in factory farms leave a great opportunity for an imbalance. Yeah. And this will cause problems. Why? Why? Competitive exclusion. So what better way to ensure food safety than to ferment? One byproduct of lactic fermentation is lactic acid. Fermenting vegetables turns a basic saltwater brine into tangy vinegar. Pathogenic bacteria cannot live in an acidic environment, while the good guys can. Anything less than a pH of 4.6 is considered acidic. By fermenting food, you're making it sour, therefore inhibiting the ability for bad bacteria to grow and keeping it submerged under a brine so no mold or fungus can grow. This is how fermentation preserves food. According to the USDA, there has never been a case of food poisoning related to fermented fruit, vegetables, grain, or legume. Is that boring? Because I think it's pretty exciting. Mm. All right, so here, let's wrap this up nice and tidy. Mm. Fermentation has been used to preserve and enhance flavors in food since the dawn of humanity. Mm. It is a natural process. It's a process that could occur in nature with no human intervention. It does not take special equipment or materials. Fermentation for food preservation and fermentation to enhance flavor, change texture, remove anti-nutrients, and make food more digestible. I believe there is a reason we as humans enjoy funky, pungent, sour tastes. It's because it indicates food safety and digestibility. In my opinion, the best way to avoid food poisoning is to have an abundant, and diverse bunch of healthy bacteria taking up residence in your body. So go start the sauerkraut already. If you're new to fermentation and you're worried about it, you can p purchase super cheap pH strips and check the pH of your ferment to make sure it's below 4.6. But if you've done it a few times, you know how to tell because it smells and tastes really sour. Anything below 4.6 is totally safe to eat. And just one quick note on botulism. For those afflicted, botulism is no joke. It takes a really precise environment to grow botulism toxin. Improperly canned low acid foods are the perfect environment. That's why home canning can get such a bad rap. If you're concerned about botulism, I suggest learning how it can occur so you know how to prevent it. I'll work on another video addressing botulism directly. Until then, I hope you're feeling more confident about fermented food and you're ready to start fermenting and make some delicious treats in your own home. Check out my fermentation playlist for lots of great recipes and ideas. I'm Lanny and this was Preserving Today.
prevent food poisoning. Get. Uh, pathogenic bacteria. Pathogenic? No. Pathogenic. Bye-bye.